Pierre Polyev is on the warpath and his target is none other than Canada's Pinocchio Justin Trudeau. Polyev tore into Trudeau's flimsy testimony on the Chinese election interference scandal, lambasting the PM's pathetic excuses and bald-faced lies regarding his lack of reading any documents or briefings about the case. Trudeau waltzed into the hearing room expecting his fake charm to smooth over his incompetence, but that fantasy crashed hard. He is busy covering up his corruption and coming up with new lies that he forgot how his chief of staff has exposed him all the way back in 2023. But Trudeau will not change his unfounded stance about the elections being fair and free, as he would rather joke around and tone down the allegations in the public eye. Canadians, however, know exactly where he is playing at and will not budge as well when it comes to exposing the liberal establishment and Trudeau. Welcome back to Street Politics Canada. Before we jump into today's video, take a second to sign up for our exclusive uncensored newsletter. The mainstream media won't report Trudeau's scandals and corruption, but our newsletter delivers the raw truth to your inbox daily. We'll leave you the link in the description box. Now let's dive into today's crazy developments. Pierre Polyev took to the stage to publicly shame and call out the failure of a prime minister called Justin Trudeau. Polyev made sure to lambast and make fun of Trudeau's dismissive remarks during his testimony on Chinese election interference in Canada. Trudeau went out there with all the unfounded confidence of a million Canadians and thought his non-existent charm and charisma would perhaps carry him to an innocent public opinion verdict. But the reality was far from that dream world of his. In an effort to appear impartial and not responsible for any slow or incompetent response to warnings about foreign interference within the Canadian election, Trudeau admitted publicly and in testimony that he never reads any paper or detailed briefings, he is only informed orally and during conversations where only the most important bullet points are read out loud to him. Trudeau chose to out himself as an incompetent fool of a leader just to defend himself from other accusations of incompetence in other areas of the investigation. This is the Prime Minister of Canada that some people choose to support for some reason. A man so incompetent and lacking any form of intelligence he can't help but implicate himself while trying to save himself. What an embarrassing display for a global leader. When it comes to briefings, uh, and others uh, can speak to this and how they make decisions about what to read from their prepared notes during an actual briefing uh, with, uh, with uh, ministers or, or a prime minister. Um, but it is much more of a... a conversation than someone reading a prepared text to what to to uh, the minister that they're briefing um you know there are elements in here that say for example in the having read the briefing note uh, in preparation for this uh, uh this inquiry um that talk about how serious foreign uh, foreign interference is and how uh, we need to do more that wouldn't have been something that uh, the CSIS director or the national security advisors or whoever would have had to spend much time on because they would have known that we did understand how serious foreign interference is and how much we take it seriously. And actually, that was why we would spend more time on specific cases or concerns that were really the meat of the briefing. So um, while notes are prepared for the briefers, what actually becomes the most important thing that I certainly recall about those briefings was the various and specific cases we went through and how they are examples of concern or not concern that we then have to behave in certain ways or have follow-ups on this or that. I mean, it is much less a large theoretical briefing and much more concrete this is a situation, and then the discussion about how we deal with this particular situation or example or another would be where the, the larger theoretical discussion and implications would come in, but they would be concentrated around specific uh, individuals or cases. Polyev took the chance to highlight the absurdity of the situation and the nature of this silly defense by Trudeau. However, in his own opinion, Polyev thinks Trudeau is not lying. And this is something Canadians can honestly go ahead and believe as everyone is already well aware of how incompetent and corrupt Trudeau and his liberal government have been during their undeserved tenure in leadership. So when Trudeau states he did not do a basic prime minister activity, then he is probably correct and that's why he should be booted straight out of the office. 
Polyev then goes on to list all the reasons this particular defense was interesting, including how it exposes all the so-called experts and the ivory tower elites who support a bumbling buffoon that does not read important documents about the safety of Canada and its people. They are more concerned about power and greed rather than actually running a nation democratically. He said something incredible, although not so surprising. Of course, what we're investigating is whether a foreign dictatorship interfered in our democracy in multiple elections to help him win, a communist dictatorship seeking to keep in office someone who said he admires that communist dictatorship. But his defense actually speaks for itself. The Prime Minister was asked why he didn't do anything about this interference, even though he was warned in briefing notes is that he doesn't read briefing notes. <laughs> now, we often don't believe the things that this guy says, but I think that most Canadians would believe that defense. <laughs> I think it's plausible that Justin Trudeau doesn't read documents that come before him. Um, in fact, I think it's likely that he doesn't read things that come before him. And I think that that defense is interesting for three reasons. One, because the ivory tower elites who support him and his ideology of concentrating all the power in their and money in their hands uh, they seem they always tell us how wonderfully sophisticated and cosmopolitan they are and how brilliant they are and that's why they're entitled they're experts after all right uh, th that's why they're entitled to decide for other people um, but yet they're prepared to support a guy who says he doesn't read it's like, he might be a know-nothing, but he's our know-nothing, right? <laughs> they support a guy who confuses decimals with decibels, who says budgets balance themselves, even when they never do, <laughs> who says he doesn't think much about monetary policy, admits he's not very good with numbers, advises Canadians to pay for their tuition and their home renovations on their credit card. And this is the bright light, the genius, that they believe should be able to run the lives of, of mechanics who are able to take apart an engine and put it back together with blindfolds on. That, that, that the single mom who can budget her, balance her budget on a minimum wage salary needs advice on budgeting from the guy who can't budget uh, for himself. That is the ultimate irony of the elitism, is that these so pseudo-intellectuals vest all their faith in this guy of all people. The second thing that's so interesting, and this came up, by the way, in his defense on another scandal, when he had accepted a quarter million dollar free vacation from someone who had met with him asking for, and later received, a $15 million grant from his government the kind of uh, cronyism that would get a small town mayor put in jail. But the defense the Prime Minister gave at the time was that in the meeting, he didn't actually, he, he, it wasn't, impo he wasn't substantially important because he actually doesn't run the government. He's a ceremonial figurehead. And therefore, he didn't have any actual power over the government he heads to give the individual what he was asking for in exchange for that famous free vacation. Even though, in the Prime Minister's own Open and Accountability Guide, the machinery of government, and that's a quote, is the exclusive responsibility of the Prime Minister. Which brings me to the second reason why his I don't read my briefing notes defense is so interesting. And it is this, he wants all the power and none of the responsibility. He literally wants to control the entire economy. He wants to nationalize large industries with monstrous taxpayer funded subsidies. And yet he, he, he wants to print $600 billion without having any responsibility for the resulting inflation. He wants to increase the cost of government without taking any of the blame for the resulting interest payments that households must pay on their own debt after he drove up 
the rates. He wants none of the responsibility for the fact that we have the slowest economic growth in the OECD over the next five years and over the next 35 years after he promised all this spending was going to stimulate the contrary. He wants to have total control over what you can see and say online to protect us all from these dangerous forces that might influence our thinking if we are not protected by the angels in the government. And yet, when there is actually a risk of manipulation by hostile and malicious actors like, say, a communist regime in Beijing, he can't even take the responsibility of reading his briefing notes. This is the irony, the great irony of his leadership, and one of the reasons why I think he's succeeded in doubling housing costs, giving us the worst inflation in 40 years, sending 2 million people to the food banks, 8,000 people signing up for a Facebook group called the Dumpster Diving Network because they now have to eat out of a garbage can after he drove food prices rising with his carbon tax. He wants to control every aspect of your life, and then when he ruins your life, he wants to take none of the responsibility for the ruin that he caused. And the third reason why this testimony and this entire scandal is so consequential and indicative is why the hell did a dictatorship, a communist dictatorship, on the other side of the world consider it such a, a, a strategic imperative to keep this guy as prime minister. What was their motive? Why did they believe that they would be better off by having him as our prime minister in at least two elections where they intervened to help him win? Why? Because he's good for Canada? Or is it because he admires their basic Chinese communist dictatorship? It does raise interesting questions on why Trudeau is just throwing his hand in the air when it comes to this particular issue, even when there is evidence, as Polyev has stated in his speech, about how Trudeau admires the communist dictatorship and wants to emulate it. The answer is not novel or new, and it has certainly been stated multiple times, but it bears mentioning once again to put it into perspective. Trudeau wants all the power and control that he can get without any of the accountability that comes as consequences for his actions. Trudeau thinks leadership is a game to him and his liberal goons, and he is now looking to cheat his way into the system and break the code of this country. And that is why he is doing his routine of claiming innocence in the face of honest adversity. Justin Trudeau would have Canadians believe he is an innocent bystander when it comes to foreign interference in our election, with his testimony being a mess consisting of outright lies to complete and utter ignorance to the severity of the subject at hand. Being well aware of credible reports of Chinese interference in the Liberal Party, Trudeau did nothing substantive to address it. His evasiveness and excuses betray a prime minister who clearly prioritized his political fortunes over national security. Trudeau admitted he was briefed about Chinese interference in the nomination of Liberal MP Han Dong just two days after the 2019 election was called. But he would rather lie about how he couldn't have acted against foreign interference because our spy agencies didn't provide explicit recommendations. This is a total abdication of his responsibility. As Prime Minister, it is his duty to direct security officials to aggressively confront threats to Canada's democratic process, punting responsibility when politically inconvenient is not leadership. This wasn't general interference or some false flags to scoff at, it was specifically about a candidate in Trudeau's own party. His security officials judged the threat as serious enough to personally brief the Prime Minister during the heat of an election campaign. Yet by his own admission, Trudeau did nothing to follow up. He displayed a shocking lack of curiosity and refused to order his own government to investigate further. Why, you might ask, what could possibly get him to not put the extra effort to truly make sure nothing was out of the ordinary? It was because he did not think the evidence was sufficient enough to pursue a full investigation. Uh, in what ended up being probably a 20-minute to half-hour conversation with Mr. Broadhurst, I asked him uh, more specifically about, um, okay, so they had plans or an intent or a capacity to do this? Do we know that they did? Did you hear from CSIS and, and the security agencies that this was actually done? Um, he, they weren't entirely certain. There was reasons to believe that perhaps it has, and perhaps there were, the indication was that there were buses uh, filled with Chinese speakers uh, at that nomination contest. Um, I asked if 
and, and as a matter, of course, those who are in uh, politics and certainly uh, on the ground riding politics know that it is regular for buses to be mobilized in particularly in contested nominations of community organizations, uh, uh, student groups, uh, you know, a particular uh, seniors residents could you know, bring a, a mini bus full of seniors to participate in, in a nomination contest. So just the existence of buses wasn't enough buses with uh, Chinese speakers or Mandarin speakers in them wasn't enough to um, be itself uh, alarming or, or a, 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 a condemnation, but it was, there were clear indications that there were concerns by CSIS that China might have been behind this um, and that those students or those individuals on the bus might have been motivated uh, or brought, mobilized to vote in that way, and these, there were concerns that CSIS had. I asked um, the extent to which they were certain that it happened, the extent to which they were certain that China was indeed behind the mobilizing of the bus or buses. And I also asked uh, whether or not CSIS had information that Han Dong knew about this whether he was a witting and aware that China had mobilized, or Chinese officials had mobilized buses for him or not. And the answers, answers were not clear from CSIS at that point, uh, according to what Mr. Broadhurst told me. I then uh, asked, I also asked if, um, if it was a close nomination if there was a sense that the actual result of the nomination uh, could have been affected by this bus or buses or what was there, and that wasn't clear at all. CSIS didn't have any conclusions to share at that point. Um, I asked Mr. Broadhurst uh, whether CSIS was making any uh, recommendations or uh, suggestions as to what we should do with this information. And it was clear um, to Mr. Broadhurst that this was very much about just letting us know so that we know and could perhaps um, take any actions that we deemed um, appropriate, but they weren't going to be recommending for us to take action of one way or a, a, another. But they also specified uh, that um, this was uh, secret information that we could not share with the candidate in question, Mr. Dong, uh, or the public at large uh, in terms of, of what they were telling us about these concerns and this allega these allegations. I then asked Mr. Broadhurst um, what the Liberal Party processes that are in place to oversee nominations, particularly contested nominations, had flagged around that nomination contest of a few weeks before. Um, there are party officials that oversee uh, the voting, the registrations, the voting, the processes, the counting. There are lawyers in place overseeing the count. Uh, there are possibilities for the losing contestant or contestants uh, to challenge uh, the result if they feel it was unfair. There are many processes because um, political parties often have some very uh, complex uh, fights around nomination uh, parties, all uh, nomination contests, all political parties are like that. Um, and Mr. Broadhurst uh, assured me that they had looked into when they heard uh, these allegations or this information from CSIS uh, and CITE and had no flags on the nomination process. Um, so then I had uh, uh, what was a brief conversation with Mr. Broadhurst uh, after we had established all that um, to sort of agree that the threshold for overturning a democratic event like an official party nomination to find out who would be the candidate for a general election, um, particularly during an election, general election, um, must have a fairly high threshold for removal of that candidate. And that was really sort of the binary choice uh, we were placed with in that situation. Acting would be removing Han Dong as our official candidate, 
Um, the other choice would be not to remove that candidate. But even not having removed that candidate, it would be something, given this information, that we would have to revisit. Certainly in the case that that candidate got elected, there would be questions we would have to follow up on um, after the election to properly understand what, uh, what happened and what, what the issues or the risks were in this situation. So but understanding that the decision to um, remove someone needed a high threshold, a threshold that incidentally I have um, met and seen many other cases. As Liberal Party leader, I have uh, on many, many different occasions uh, had to uh, ask people to step down or step away or desist as candidates for the Liberal Party. As most recently as the last election where we did that in the, in the case of uh, a downtown Toronto riding. Um, but in this case, I didn't feel that there was sufficient or sufficiently credible information that, that would justify this. This is the Prime Minister having a casual conversation about election interference without even reading the key memos and playing dumb when questioned so that he is not held accountable when actual evidence comes out. The choice was clear by Trudeau to ignore and keep ignoring valid warnings from his government because it affected his corrupt political standing. But this is the work of an incompetent fool, right? It is just the bad luck of Canadians that Trudeau is the one in charge and he always fumbles, right? Well, this is where I think calling him incompetent is doing him a lot of favors. Trudeau was incompetent and half-witted when it comes to navigating government and Canadian issues. However, let us not forget how liberals can be snakes and how Trudeau has displayed his fair share of malice and intentional corruption. When it comes to his testimony regarding never reading any of the briefings on the case, he was 100% lying as usual and his chief of staff is the one that exposed him all the way back in 2023. Katie Telford, chief of staff for the prime minister, testified on the same issue back in 2023 and after incessant questioning on whether Trudeau happened to have read any of the documents pertaining to the case, she confirmed to the election interference committee that the prime minister always gives time and reads any document or briefing that he is required to. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Telford, for appearing. Uh, Ms. Telford, through you, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Brock provided the context of the special report date stamped January of 2022. So now that he has provided that context, can you confirm that the Prime Minister received that document and did he read it? Uh, so in terms of the specific document that you're referencing that was mentioned in reporting, uh, sorry, Madam Chair, that the um, and that the previous member was mentioning, I can't speak to whether or not we've been briefed on um, any specific documents or any specific subjects. But taking a step back from that and to the member's second part of his question, of course the Prime Minister reads any documents he does receive. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Telford, when was the Prime Minister first briefed about Beijing's election interference in the 2019 election? When? Um, so you've received from, Madam Speaker, the, the committee has received uh, from the NSIA the list of formal briefings that was put together as, as best everybody could uh, in terms of formal briefings on subjects to do with election foreign Ms. interference. Ms. Telford, uh, respectfully, through you, Madam Chair, I'm not just asking about formal briefings. I'm asking when did the Prime Minister become aware of Beijing's election interference in the 2019 election? Just the date, please. It's been five months. It's been repeatedly asked. Uh, you're the top official in the Prime Minister's office. Canadians deserve to know when he first learned about it. Could you please answer? Madam, Madam Speaker, I would just take a, or Madam Chair, I would take a step back and just say this has been an ongoing conversation over many months and years as to what prospects were of potential foreign interference. It's why these different organizations were in place. It's why there was a report that came out of the 2019 campaign yeah. or election. Again, uh, Ms. Telford, I want to be clear that uh, Canadians deserve uh, a date, so maybe to uh, provide uh, some, you know, to, to uh, provide further clarity, uh, the Intelligence Assessment Secretariat of the PCO prepared a 
daily foreign intelligence brief dated February 21st, 2020, uh, in which uh, it, it, that document has been produced to this committee, a heavily redacted version of that document. It speaks of, quote, uh, subtle but effective interference networks in the context of Beijing and its interference in the 2019 election. Uh, it speaks of, quote, investigations into activities linked to the Canadian federal election in 2019 reveal an active foreign interference network. Uh, on what date did the Prime Minister receive this document? I could not tell you what date he did or didn't receive a document. D did it's the Prime Minister receive that document? I, I don't have that information in front of me in terms of that specific document you're you, holding. You don't have any information about that document. Now, it was a daily and foreign intelligence brief for you, Madam Chair. It was, in the, it was a daily foreign intelligence brief. Uh, Ms. Thomas said that it would have been in the Prime Minister's daily reading material. Would she be wrong? It may have been. Um, I am not suggesting she's wrong. It's that I can't speak to where he was that day. Sometimes briefs, briefs come in a whole bunch of different formats um, because those, that, those kinds of pieces of information are not just floating around. Um, so I don't know whether he got a verbal brief that day, whether he got a re weekly wrap-up that week, or whether this was a daily one that he it, it, had on his desk. This, this document has been widely reported. It's one of the very few documents that have been produced to this committee, and it's highly relevant mm -hmm to the question of what the Prime Minister knew and when he knew about Beijing's election interference. And your inability or refusal to answer uh, whether the Prime Minister had, in fact, read this document, was briefed about it, uh, is troubling. It doesn't inspire confidence, and in, in, in fact, it invites suspicion. And uh, perhaps your unwillingness to confirm that uh, is because, as Global News has reported, uh, that document spoke of, quote, foreign interference networks in the greater Toronto area that implicate at least 11 candidates in the 2019 election, uh, that Beijing's Toronto consulate was involved, and that it involved the clandestine transfer of funds. So, in other words, the Prime Minister seemingly knew as early as February of 2020 about candidates, why has he misled Canadians for the past five months? Um, so a couple of things, Madam uh, Chair, is one, everything the Prime Minister receives, um, he spends a lot of time with and he most definitely reads. Uh, so I can confirm that if they are documents that he received, he absolutely read them. So wait, if we were already aware of how he read the documents in 2023, why would he blatantly lie in 2024 about the careful and intricate process where he just never reads any document and only know about some bullet points given to him through a casual conversation? Clearly our Prime Minister thinks he can flat out lie about his conduct without consequence. Or was he too incompetent to even remember how he lied in the first place and as such have invented a new contradicting lie? It should not be that hard to categorize a Prime Minister even when he checks all the corrupt boxes. But with Trudeau, Everything he states is either embarrassing on all fronts or an outright lie that can be fact-checked as easily as how China interfered in our elections to hand the Liberals an undeserved victory. Trudeau loves talking about establishing the Foreign Interference Commission to supposedly safeguard our democracy. Yet his testimony exposed his apathy and deniability tactics in the face of credible threats. He loves to go on a tirade lying about his involvement and the misinformation conservatives supposedly peddle all so that he can stand there with a dumbfounding conviction that the elections were fair and there was no interference involved in favor of any of the running parties. I would have already have been briefed multiple times by the clerk and by others uh, that their conclusion was that the elections in 2019 were indeed free and fair and uh, the outcome was uh, not affected by foreign interference either overall or in uh, in the specific riding contests. Never attempting to single any act or focus on how his Liberal Party is the only one benefiting from such action, Trudeau would rather joke around and act like his weak charisma will just tone down the mood and paint an image of how unserious these allegations are. And again, going back to the reporting I just showed you, there's obviously a reference to busing there. But what I want to suggest to you is that the emphasis, again, wasn't on the mode of travel for these people. Uh, they took buses this time, all right. 
They could have come some other way and it wouldn't terribly matter for the services perspective because their concern was that they were directed by PRC and assisted in getting to the nomination place in order to allegedly help one candidate over another. So it, uh, the, the, the way they go out there doesn't matter one way or another. I understand your point that you wanted to make sure that CSIS understood that buses per se are not a problem. But uh, my uh, proposition to you, sir, is that when you read that statement, the, the emphasis is on direction by China. Yes, they got there by buses. That's the allegation. They could have got there by tricycles. It doesn't terribly matter. The point is they were directed by China. I would suggest that it might be more difficult for a foreign actor to organize fleets of individuals showing up on tricycles uh, rather than filling them into a bus. This is his sad excuse of an attempt to make this all seem like a joke to every honest and hardworking Canadian. But his efforts are in vain when every Canadian knows Trudeau is the actual joke here. Lying and corruption is his second nature. Incompetence and stupidity is just who he is. This is the prime minister that wants to destroy Canada from within with the help of the Chinese Communist Party so that he can gain more control and power over Canadians. Canadians do not need a malicious and chaotic actor in power. They need some common sense conservatism to get them out of this liberal hellhole. Well, that's all for now. Do you think Trudeau will be held accountable for his lies to the committee? Or will he avoid any punishment until he is out of office? Let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, kindly subscribe and leave a like for this video and our other videos because they go a long way in helping our latest content rank. Follow us on our new Twitter account, where we post stuff we can't post on YouTube. You can find the link in the description below. Thanks again for your support, and we'll see you in the next one.